thank you for spending your session time with us here this afternoon. I know there's a few things going on, so we appreciate it. So we're here to talk about how story maps can be used uh, in a study abroad curriculum uh, in order to enhance the student takeaways. So I, what I'm going to try to do is, uh, this is what we're going to talk about, and I'm going to try to rush through my part. So I'm going to give you the 50,000 foot view, because what I want to do is I want to devote most of the time to the artists and share so that they can give perspectives from the, from the actual faculty side of things and the student side of things, and then show you the examples, which is really where these things shine. Um, but I'm going to start out and give a little bit of background here. So what is the course? Well, it's a two-week study abroad course, um, along with, I think, some front-end readings and work, uh, which Marcus can maybe fill you in on, which ultimately went to Germany, and then the bulk of the time was in Italy. So they spent time in Munich, Verona, or Naples, or Pompeii. Uh, and what is this trying to do? Well, it's trying to recreate in some small fashion the sort of grand tour experience, which was something that was very popular from the 17th through the 19th centuries with young aristocrats, as you can see here, these are some paintings which would sort of typify the example. Uh, and primarily what these aristocrats would do is they would come from England and other places, and they would generally go to Rome especially. They would also go to other places, but they would spend most of the time in Rome. And while they were there, they would take in the culture and the art and all of this kind of stuff. It was, it was considered sort of a culmination of their education in some ways. So prior iterations of this course typically ask students to create what you might expect, writings, journals, letters, you know, travel letters, these kinds of things, the more traditional things that you might expect from that this. But what I approached him with, I said, look, there are these things called story maps, and I'll tell you what story maps are, and what would it be like if we gave your students the opportunity to just take these and run with it? You know, maybe not as the only deliverable from the class, but just as a deliverable, and let's just see what, what will happen. <coughs> So he was brave enough and maybe crazy enough to sign on and agree to do this. He said, sure. So I love it when faculty are willing to partner with us like this. Um, so what are story maps? Well, they are quite simply digital objects that facilitate integration of lots of different types of data. So these are typically maps, uh, but also other things like text, images, videos, whatever media. And you can kind of mash these up. And what I like to say is that um, they sort of tell a spatial narrative in some way. And there are several templates available for this, and these templates um, can range everywhere from things that are more suited to sort of a journalistic account of a journey or of a topic, to um, you know, kind of a slideshow, to more of a travel log. So there are lots of different ways that you can use these things. And as I said, what these ultimately create is a spatial narrative. So it kind of takes you on a journey that is grounded in some sort of space and place. Now generally these are created through ArcGIS Online, and I'll talk more about why that's a good and a bad thing in a minute. However, you are not limited to that. All of the templates that Esri has are open source, and they are available for you to download. So if you know a little bit of HTML, JavaScript, and CSS, you can take these things, and you're not restricted to doing them through Esri's kind of ecosystem. You can take them, pull them down, post them locally, and uh, create these as modified or not as you like. So what did we hope to accomplish with this? Well, I was trying to convince Marcus to use these things as a more holistic way of assessing student takeaways. So because they allow integration of different types of narratives, you know, so students are going to take pictures, they might take videos, they might write down what's going on. Um, it's a way to sort of combine all of those uh, into a wrapped up package that uh, joins them together in interesting and creative ways. Story maps are also a vector for building digital skills, and that's some of what we're talking about here at this conference in general. So by working on story maps, students get exposure to web application development, working with mixed digital media, digital photography and videography, and GIS and digital cartography. So it's a way to, you know, sort of an umbrella way to link together experiences in all of these different technologies. And really, to me, this is an embodiment of what liberal arts is all about. It takes writing, it takes editing, it takes spatial thinking, and it makes you blend all of these together to create something. So to me, I really love um, how that works and how that plays out. There are some limitations with this. The full capabilities require an institutional subscription to Esri. Now, I don't know if many of you know what this is, but if your campus has a subscription to ArcGIS, you might have heard it called like that or whatever, you have access to Story Maps also. Now, not all campuses do. Um, but like I say, you can get a free account, you can download these things, so you're not actually limited to it. It's just nice because they give you the framework for working with them if you have an existing subscription. 
So our model was to create a group within sort of the web management console of this um, for the course and let the students have at it, you know, make their stuff, and then ultimately when they were done and happy with it, they would share with this group so that the group and the faculty member could go in and kind of see each other's work. Uh, within the sort of Esri ecosystem, I don't love it because managing users and content remains less than robust in terms of the tools that they provide out of the box to do it. They are improving, they have dramatically improved over the last couple of years. Um, there are third party tools that can kind of improve this experience, but I do continue to have questions of long term user and content management. But luckily for us, this was sort of the first foray, foray into this as a campus, and so I'm not having to deal with managing lots of users and content yet. This is kind of a nice pilot for us. So what I want to do now is I'm going to turn it over to Marcus, and he's going to walk you through some of the example sites and then uh, talk about some of the goods and bads, as it were. Right, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Marcus Kubishark, and I uh, must begin with uh, two disclaimers. Uh, the first is I'm a classicist, and my, my real comfort zone is books. So, um, um, but you know, I, I teach young students and I have kids, and Lafayette takes pride in being a tech savvy campus, so I'm trying to hang in there. <laughs> and uh, I also really uh, very happy to use Dunk that Jason's suggestion of incorporating story maps into our Italy uh, intro trip. But if, so I'll, if something goes wrong here, I might be chasing someone else to come to my rescue, so just be ready for that. And uh, the other disclaimer, I will also, um, as Jason did, rush, really good, rush through, uh, through some examples uh, that you'll be seeing. Uh, it will not do justice to what we accomplished on the trip as a whole. It will also not even do justice to the individual uh, story map projects that I will show you. It will just be enough to get, to show you the, the the variance of what's possible. And if you have more questions about any of these, we can talk about them in the Q&A or anyway. So uh, let's see. I would, so there were 24 students on this interim trip. And I think the story map projects that we got back, uh, they fall into three categories. And I'll show you one example of each. Uh, the first category is in a way the, the or the basic category that is using story maps more or less as a digital photo album. And that's pretty much it. Um, works well, but pretty basic. Uh, the second category is uh, more sophisticated. That would be combining uh, the photo album function with the, the map function that is in way at the core of, of story maps and linking that in interesting ways. Uh, so that's made us, among the sophisticated ones, that's the one that makes heavy use of the map. And the third category, um, I would also label as sophisticated, but not relying on the map function, but rather on other things that story maps allows uh, the users to do. So here we go with, um, I'll just take this here. Uh, here we go with. Rebecca Brown's story map, and that is one, uh, that is an example of a digital photo album, so the first basic type. And uh, she has a nice picture to start us off with a, a title and a, and a thematically related uh, quote. Uh, we travel initially to lose ourselves, and we travel next to find ourselves. And then we scroll down, and the uh, town hall of Munich appears. Uh, we started our grand tour in Munich, and I will I will now have a few shots from Munich and Bavaria, which I will do in very 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 fast forward mm -hmm. until we get to um, until we get to to here. Travel to Verona. Uh, one of the experiences I wanted the students to get on this trip is, is the experience of traveling into Italy. And you get that, you don't necessarily get that when you just fly into Rome. So we go to Germany and have the experience of crossing the Alps um, as a major geological but also cultural barrier 
uh, in Europe. But we took a train from the main stage to Munich to Verona. While traveling on the train, the Alps began to appear almost out of nowhere, and it was one of the most beautiful and impressive natural sights I've seen. And we then have, this is at the point of highest elevation on the border between Austria and Italy, uh, where the train stopped for 20 minutes and you could get off. So it feels like you're up on the moon. And then uh, we will again move forward a little. Uh, and you see there are the Alps in the background still. And the next major stop on our grand tour was Verona, finally crossing Italy. As a linguist, I would say she should have said finally having crossed uh, had to <laughs> past parts of it, but <laughs> crossing was up in the mountains. So, um, so this is this is clearly no longer Germany, but Italy, and uh, then there is pictures of Verona with um, interesting captions, captions, and more pictures and people. And here we can, yeah, we get to Rome. Um, that's the starting with the Rome, uh, with another quote, and um, I'll leave it there. So that's that gives an idea of, of the photo album. And the next story map I want to show you is by Beatrice Gassner. So Beatrice uh, really worked hard to to make use of the maps. And so before we even start. Uh, I want to show you a few things. So this is our title image and, and uh, another schematic quote, quote uh, which we could magnify. Uh, then there is the map that every picture that she took, and they're down here in the gallery at the bottom, every picture that she took is numbered and is also appears as a pin on this map. And we can zoom in uh, down into this street uh, to, to the city map um, to be able to trace our journey and if you hit individual pictures uh, for instance the, the um, sleeping fawn at the Victorique in Munich uh, we have uh, Beatrice gave us an image and there's a caption below the second day Munich uh, included a tour of the Gisbertek Museum. One of the museum highlights includes the Barberini Fountain, a perfect example of Hellenistic sculpture. Uh, if you want to say, take a closer look, we can magnify it and we can uh, make it small again. And here is the pin drop right in Munich by the Prince Platz where the, the Gisbertek is. So that's one. The next, uh, and, oh no, that's too far. I wanted to show you um, another image of the mountains. Uh, the Innsbruck, the Brenner Pass. Next, we took a train through the Austrian Alps from Munich to Verona. Again, we can, we can magnify. And normally, uh, there should be the map of. I'm not quite sure where the map is. I'm going to do that in a good test run. Ah, there we go. Okay, so this is uh, this is the, the train station up at the Brenner Pass, and if we zoom out a little bit, um, you see where we are in the, in the middle of the mountain. There's this book, for example, Munich is further north, the Ona is further south, um, and we can just cruise through Beatrix's images that are all linked with, with addresses, um, places that of my wolf and, and she even uh, uh, even had uh, Italian cuisine. What would a trip to Rome be without pasta and Parmesan cheese bowl? And you can find so we could zoom in and to find the restaurant where Beatrice had that fabulous photo of pasta. <laughs> and um, another example, this is down from Pompeii. Uh, House of the Fawn. This was one of the largest and most impressive private residences in, in the city of Pompeii. Um, here is the pin, which if you zoom in really close and you've been to Pompeii, you recognize it's actually drawn. She, she placed the house in the middle of the Forum of Pompeii, 
uh, which is not where he was, but somewhere in the residential district. But you know, it's, it's still it's a very very good effort. So um, that is um, Beatrice's uh, sophisticated attempt making use of the story map map function, and we'll now switch to uh, Shira's example. Shira, who will also be saying a few words in a moment. Um, that's another quite sophisticated uh, version, but without the map. What Shira created is what I would uh, call a, a multi-content level and also multimedia collage. So you're going to see uh, text blocks, large text blocks as bookends or as separators uh, between thematic sections. Uh, there will be, of course, many pictures. There will be a couple of videos, and uh, there will be quotes embedded and all that in a, you know, structure that is more complex than I can explain here. There are certain recurring themes that come up at different places. Um, so I want to show you that. So this is the starting image. And here we have uh, Eingang, uh, just started in Germany. So entrance with uh, Pico Iyer quote. We then have a number of images from Munich, and I'll move down to uh, so, uh, here a collage of or a collection of subway stations that we relied on <coughs> during the couple days we were in Munich uh, was another uh, quite profound quote by Pico Iyer. Then um, we get to Verona. In Verona, there's a video of a kind of witch burning ritual that was taking place when we were there. Uh, I'll not play that, but I'll play the different video in a moment. And so here's uh, Verona, amphitheater, and so forth. Um, Rome, Piazza uh, del Popolo, the Porta del Popolo, to which we stepped in the movie, signing very important movie. Um, and Pantheon, and near the Pantheon, or outside the Pantheon, I should say, uh, there was a uh, Shira captured just the mood of this very late afternoon. It was about 5 p.m. We were exhausted, but also sort of exhilarated after a pretty scene. Uh, and so we have this scene outside the Pantheon. Um, there should be sound. Oh, that's too bad. So, well, there's a street musician playing. Well, without the sound, it's only half the experience. But uh, anyway, yeah, there he is. So that's how you can incorporate video into story maps. There's the Pantheon and um, Mark has that music fine. Yep, yep, yep. And <laughs> where, where, where uh, the Ushita, uh, which corresponds with the uh, Aingang at the beginning, uh, that is that is Shira's uh, sort of um, collage. Okay. And I'll leave the reflection part to Shira about would we do it again, how would we do it, because it all, in the end it comes down to, to the students, it doesn't work for them, and Shira was both well, speak to that. And so I'll just address a brief point about which the students sort of experienced the story uh, project. So the first one which was uh, the main highlight of the project for the students was uh, primarily that it was sort of as Jason had mentioned it was holistic so you could really use it as a point of reflection for your trip and that it uh, sort of varied from the rest of the work that we did so we did a lot of um, sort of writing journal writing uh, letter writing as well so that this uh, was really variants from what we had done throughout the course of the of the class in general the main complaint that the students had was that the actual software, so the program of the um, story map was a little bit clunkier than they would have hoped. So there was sort of a dichotomy of complaints involved, the first of which was that it um, didn't actually provide the tools they hoped would be provided. And then the second of that dichotomy was that they couldn't figure out how to use the tools that were provided. <laughs> um, and then finally, I would remark that the uh, general consensus was that it was a useful part of the class because it had varied and it was holistic. 
um, and it's just a, a nice way to incorporate technology. Uh, but going forward, there'll be uh, hope to sort of bridge that technological gap. So I'm a computer science major, so I have a lot of the complaints that some of the uh, other students had, uh, and then better equipped me to make a story map. So of course, he's coming from other areas because every type of student could take this class. Uh, there would need to be some sort of bridging of the technological gap, whether it's some sort of tutorial within the software or just instruction. While you're doing that, can I answer a question from the previous team? Um, so, uh, Esri links into their own maps. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. So they have a bunch of base layers available. You know, everything from photography to satellite views to street views. You know, whatever you need, and you can create those maps and then embed them, links to them from within. A story map. Okay, but you can't um, put in a like a 17th century you map. Can. You, you can. can actually, yes. You can you can digitize and geo-reference a 17th century map, upload it as a tile set, and load it in. Okay, so you can you, you can digitize um, a cross section of a cell. Sure. And, yeah. and absolutely map place lap, map location. Absolutely you can do that. Okay. Yep, thank you. So in, in the future, one of the the visions we would have is you could actually take a map, an ancient map, blend it with the current story maps map, and because we're moving around in, or in both worlds, we're moving around in Italy as it is now, but we're also uh, kind of moving around in the ancient spaces. So uh, that would that would be a step that would be great if we could take that to kind of even more. And you can do that. You know, there are tools that allow you. You know, there are sliders that would allow you to show one map over another. A spyglass that would let you look through a top layer map to a bottom layer. So there's lots of ways to do that, but it does require more time and more prep and, and a higher bar of, of understanding the tool set to do it. But it's absolutely feasible. Cool. Thank you. Yes, so the URLs can be either private or shared just internally with your organization or made public out to the web and included as part of just as reason, you know, gallery of, of, of these story maps in which there are thousands and thousands of them. Um, but otherwise, because they're just a standard web technology, you could, if you wanted, in some ways PDF them, do whatever. I think you'd lose a lot if you did that because they are meant to be in some ways interactive and you saw Marcus you know, moving around the maps and zooming in and stuff. That's what they're really meant to be, are these sort of interactive objects. But yeah, you can do that. Can we do that in iframe? Yes, they're absolutely uh, uh, shareable and, and embeddable.